All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. People will in as they recognize that it started, um, and they can watch it later on. So um, this lecture is about what is a PDA and what valuable skills can it teach you to help you get better at your current high school event. Um, just briefly to introduce ourselves, um, I'm Jonah. You may have seen me around on the PF server, been there a little while, probably need to leave. Um, Emmanuel is, uh, I'll let him introduce himself actually. Yeah, I have no experience at all with PF or high school debate, um, but I envy you for that. Um, I do collegiate APTA. I've like finaled a bunch of times this semester and I like, just love debate. Um, I'm excited to teach you about APTA. Yeah, Emmanuel's a fantastic debater. Um, so definitely listen to what he says. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. All right, so just first um, talking about what an APTA round sort of entails. Um, it is a two versus two debate, um, similar to PF. Um, it is pretty casual, meaning there, there's no suits for people that like dressing up. Um, you can swear in your speeches. Um, it's pretty just like uh, casual practice um, that goes on. But specifically, the most one of the most important things about APTA is that the topic changes every round. So um, in PF and other high school events, um, the topic is set and everyone debates that topic for a month or two months or even a year. Um, but the topic in an after round changes every single round. So um, people can pick what they want to debate about. So when you're writing um, your case, you can just pick a topic and write a case on that topic. So it can be about literally anything that you're passionate about. It can be like domestic policy, international relations, economics, social justice, art, sports, whatever you're interested in. Um, you can write a case about it and you can force the other team to debate about it with you. Um, what this also means is because people don't know what you're going to debate, what you're bringing into the round, every speech besides the very first one is basically entirely extemporaneous. So the other team will have to extemp their um, opposition, their neg to your case, um, and then you will have to go from there as well as the, as the team writing the case. Um, this also means that arguments are entirely founded in analysis. So um, the other side won't know the topic, so you can't abu be abusive and use statistics, um, expert opinions, citations, etc. You instead just have to logically warrant all of your arguments um, and explain why um, they make sense logically instead of just relying on um, evidence to do so. Um, this does not mean that just flowery rhetoric can win you the round. It really is based on how good your argument is, how logically sound it is, um, and how you deal with the opponent's arguments as well. Um, so there's two sides. The first side is side government. Um, again, as I said, they choose the topic. So an example topic could be, um, you know, black people should be exempt from the draft. And then the um, government team would write a case um, advocating for that position. And then the opposition team would have to um, do the neg of that uh, position. So they would have to say black people should not be exempt from the draft. Um, there are two speakers, as there are two people. Um, the first one is the prime minister. Um, which is essentially the first speaker on the Gov team. And they have two speeches. The PMC, Prime Minister Constructive, um, opens the debate. So they are the one who reads the case, um, just as the first speaker in PF would read the case. Um, and the Prime Minister rebuttal um, concludes the round. So you can think of this as like the sort of second final focus. It is the last speech in the round. Um, and the PMR will always be the one to deliver that speech. So it's the same person. Um, delivering the first speech and the last speech in the round. And then the MG um, is the member of government. They're the other speaker for the government side, and they have one speech, um, and that is sort of in the middle of the round, and we'll get to the order in a second. Um, you can. Yeah, uh, then there's side opposition, who's opposing side gov. Um, they're sort of responding to the case that gov brought forward. They are allowed to counter case if uh, there's like some nuance there, but Generally, you're allowed to counter case as long as it's mutually exclusive. Um, and you can run theory if you think the case was abusive. So while side government can bring forward anything that's interesting to them, there are limitations through theory and counter cases. Um, side opposition is started with the leader of opposition. That first speech is the constructive, and it's directly after PMC. 
you spend about half of LOC providing your own new material, and then about half of it rebutting the prime minister's case that they gave. And then the leader of opposition also gives the second to last speech of the round, which is the last speech for side opposition. Um, it's like four and a half minutes, and it's sort of explaining why you won the round. Um, then the other part of side opposition is the member of opposition, and that's what Jonah is wrapped up. Um, and that's also the constructive speech. It's very important because it's your last chance to beat arguments from Gov um, directly with new material. So yeah, typically if you were if you were a new app to novice, we tell you to memorize this. Obviously, you as high schoolers do not, um, but this is just sort of the order um, that the speeches go in. So there's six total speeches and it goes back and forth um, between the case uh, being read, the LOC, which is sort of the NEG's case and NEG responses, um, the MG, which is sort of the um, government team frontlining their own case um, and then beating the uh, NEG case. And then the MO, which does sort of the same thing, just in reverse. Um, and then there's a second neg speech back to back, where um, there is a, it's called a LOR, so leader of opposition rebuttal. Um, and we'll get into what the two rebuttals are in a second, but basically there's two speeches in a row for the op side, and then the gov team ends off the round with the PMR, um, and these are the time limits for each speech. Yeah, uh, then this is the leader of opposition, so this is like, getting to the rebuttal portion of the round. This speech is four and a half minutes. It's given by the LO, and you'll note the LO got to do the constructive plus the rebuttal. Um, and again, no new material. Um, the job of the rebuttal is to do two things. The first is to explain why you won the round, and the second is why Gov didn't win the round. So when you're explaining why you did win the round, there's no new material, but you're sort of summarizing how the judge should feel about the arguments that were given in the round. So you could establish a framework for why you're winning, like way wider impacts are more important, like path dependencies, a bunch of stuff, like things you'll learn in APTA. Um, and it's sort of interesting because objectively, even if you lost the round, if you can make the judge feel like you won and rebuttal, then that's a really effective LOR. Um, the second thing you're doing is preempting the PMR because um, obviously Gov speaks last and that's pretty broken that they can do that because they can make you look like you were losing if you forgot to respond to something or something like that. So what LOR wants to do is as the round's going through, they want to be combing the flow a bunch of times. Like if I were PMR, like what's the strongest way PMR could collapse? Where are they probably going to go for? And you can do that by looking at MG, right? MG a lot of times will be trying to set up the PMR because the remember the MG is in the middle of the round, middle of the gov speech. So they're probably trying to set up things that PMR can ultimately use to collapse. And they'll often accidentally tell you what PMR is going to say. So you can use that information to structure LOR to beat PMR before they even said a word. And the reason that's cool is because once PMR gets up and it's like they have their pre-prepared collapse and they say everything you just beat, they've lost the round. Um, other thing that's important about LOR is that it's really open speech. There are a lot of ways you can structure it. These are just a couple of ways. The easiest and most successful way is to just do three points of crystallization. That's sort of three issues you've heard throughout the round that seem pretty important. You explain why you won under those issues. And crucially, you explain which of these issues is most important. And you want to explain the one that's most important that it's like would be legitimate to say that it's most important. So if there's like a nuclear war impact in the round, and then there's like a baby will like get spanked or something, like you're not going to say the baby getting spanked is the most important impact in the round, even if you're winning that issue. But if you can manage to be explain that something's the most important and you're winning it, then that's awesome. And you want to do that as you go through the three points of crystallization, like this is first, this is second, this is third. Um, another way is to do two frameworks. This is the one I use a lot. This is when both teams disagree on what's the most important thing. They might disagree is the frag or the principle more important. They might agree uh, is your citizens more important than other citizens. So when you're doing this one, you wanna do framing at the top. You're gonna to say, okay, judge, these are the two frameworks you could use. We warranted ours better for this reason. Ours is the better framework for this reason. Then you wanna win under your framework and show why Gov didn't. And then you want to say, but even if you think that our framework is wrong and you agree with Gov, we also win on that one. But remember, this one is less important than our framework. You want to like tell them that so they don't mess up. Um, finally, like you can do burdens. So um, it's really rare for rounds to happen like this, but sometimes you can do something called nested burdens, is what I, how I think of it. But sometimes government has really awful structure where they need to prove a lot of things. So they might have to prove that they can do something then they might have to prove that once they do that thing, it's gonna be effective. 
And then once that happens, it's going to be immoral or like that'll lead to a better world. As many burdens as you can set up for Gov like that, if you win in all of those burdens or even one of those burdens, Gov has lost the round. Um, so that's another way to collapse. Um, there's going to be space for questions at the end. So I won't spend a whole lot more time there, but if you have a question about the nested burden analysis, it's pretty cool. Um, and next is PMR. Yeah, so PMR, in my opinion, is one of the, the coolest um, strategic speeches because there's so much you can do with it. Um, so it is, it's five minutes and 30 seconds. Um, and you generally just like broadly have two jobs. The first is responding to new arguments that were made in the MO. So you recently just came off of the op block where the op had two speeches. And now it is your job to respond to any new content that was made in the last um, neg constructive speech. Um, so that is your first job to respond to new arguments from there. And then also um, your second job is similar to the LOR in that you need to summarize the arguments in the round um, and explain to the judge why you won those arguments. So you can do any of the structures that um, Emmanuel just explained. You can do uh, three points of crystallization. Um, you can do burden analysis. Um, you can do the two frameworks, um, whatever it may be, but you aren't preempting anything because you already um, know what the LOR said, you were coming after them. So you can be a lot more strategic in this speech um, since you already know everything that the op has put out into the, in the round. Um, you can make strategic decisions about um, things you might want to drop, things you might want to um, try to co-opt, um, et cetera. So uh, yeah, uh, can we go back one slide? There we go. Um, yeah, so for responses to MO, something cool that uh, a lot of people do is instead of just taking a whole part of the speech and saying, I'm going to respond to MO in this part, similar to how um, rebuttals do it in PF when they go first on their case, then on the other side, um, you instead in this part can sort of incorporate those responses into your sort of uh, broad categories of like voting issues. Um, so you can say, um, you know, this is the topic area. Here's why we're winning that topic. They said an MO, blah, blah, blah. But we said uh, our responses are this, this, and this. Um, what, that's really important because X, Y, Z. Um, so you, instead of just separating it, you can incorporate it. Uh, it makes it seem like it's really smooth um, and like everything they said is sort of insufficient and, and you won the round. Obviously, you still have to weigh. Um, that's very, very important in this speech because it's the last speech in the round, last thing that the judge will remember. Um, even if they are flowing, especially if they're flowing. So yeah, go to the next slide. And then there's something called like just generally points and they serve different purposes and they're asked at different times. The first one is points of clarification. And this is where directly after Gov has given their, their uh, case statement, what you're gonna be debating about. Opposition is allowed to ask them questions about that just to gain more information so they can actually debate and access the round. Yeah, um, the second type of point is points of information. You can consider this very similar to cross-examination in high school debate, except um, you need to call the point of information in the middle of someone's speech, um, and they can choose to accept that point or not. If they choose to accept that point, the person that called it will then be able to ask a question um, similar to a cross X question, trying to poke holes, et cetera. Um, and the person then responds. Um, generally, people only take points of information if they are pretty confident that they have a good answer um, to whatever the question may be. Um, but yeah, this is sort of the only mechanism to have cross X in um, APTA is through points of information. And then the final type of point um, and something that, in my opinion, other types of debate desperately need is called points of order. So what that is, is in the final two speeches in APTA, the two uh, rebuttal speeches can't make new arguments. So the PMR can make new responses to the MO because that would be their only chance to, but you can't make uh, brand new arguments that are either responsive to stuff that was before the MO or um, just like new arguments that haven't been in the round so far or new responses. Um, when this does happen, because it does, people do try to get away with it, the other team can call point of order in the middle of the speech. The time then stops, they stop the timer. And then the team calling the point of order tries to say what argument they are calling new and why they think it's new. Then the other team has a chance to say why they don't think it's new um, and where they said it previously. Um, and then the judge takes that both sides under consideration um, and sort of rules on that either on the spot or later on when they're coming to the RFD 
um, they rule on if it was or was not new. If they do find it is a new point, they will just cross it off the flow um, and not consider it in the RFD. Um, and if it wasn't, obviously they will take it as considered. This is super important in my opinion, um, because it is a good check on abuses um, because debaters can sort of call each other out for uh, breaking the rules. All right, so what do you learn from APTA? And we'll get into a second how it applies to uh, PF, but what do you learn? The first is analytical responses. Um, pretty clear why this is the case, because you cannot have cards um, in APDA. So you must just like basically use your brain to figure out what, uh, what responses are responsive. Um, and you must use analytics for all of these things um, because there are no cards. Um, the second is argument generation. So uh, what we mean by argument generation is when you hear a topic, um, you can very quickly think of a lot of different arguments or responses to that topic um, just based on your ability to like garner up arguments. Um, so why this is, uh, actually we'll get into that in a second. Um, the third one is topic breadth. So in APDA, obviously, as we previously mentioned, um, there is a new topic every round. Um, so not only for case tournaments where people write their own cases, um, you'll have a really, really wide scope of, of, of topics that you must debate about, but also at things called motions tournaments where they um, preset the motion um, before each round, the tournament uh, directors. Um, those are also going to be pretty wide range of topics as well. So you generally get a wide variety of topics that you must debate and you learn a lot about all of those topics um, and you necessarily must learn all about them um, if you want to be successful at debating them. Um, and then finally, strategy is a really big one. Um, first part of that strategy is argument interaction. Because the speeches are long and because everything is logically warranted, there's a lot more pieces to deal with, a lot more moving pieces um, that interact with each other as well. So there are a lot of places where different warrants will interact with warrants on different sides of the flow or in other pieces of your case that you must recognize how they interact. So say, for example, one piece of your case um, can work as defense on another piece of your case if applied there, but you just don't necessarily know it. Recognizing those interactions and how these things would play out in the real world um, and then sort of applying that to the round um, is super, super important, specifically in PMR and LOR. Um, and then second, collapses. Um, everyone in debate does collapses, but collapses in APTA are specifically important um, because there's just not enough time in four minutes and 30 seconds or five minutes and 30 seconds um, to fully go in on, on every argument in the round that has been um, talked about. So you must collapse on what you think is the most important and then get into the sort of smaller things as is done in uh, final focus and summary and PF. And finally is time allocation. This is maybe one of the most important things that you can learn in a uh, public forum, um, because if you mess up your time allocation, um, it can really mess you up the rest of the round. Um, APTA teaches you time allocation, especially in speeches like um, the LOC and the MG, um, where you have to figure out how much time you want to spend building your own arguments and how much time you want to spend um, responding to other arguments. So why that's super important is um, People, for example, have gone and spent most of their speech developing their own side of case because that's what they thought is strategic and very little time um, actually beating the gov side of case. I won't name any names, but people do do that. And sometimes it is quite effective, but the determination of when to do that is really important and when it is actually appropriate to do so and when it's appropriate to instead go and respond a lot to the on case. Um, that can be very applicable in speeches like rebuttal where you have to make that choice if you want to say frontline literally everything on your case and just go all in on your case versus um, frontline only just maybe the turns and then uh, go on and heavily cover their case. Um, we can go to the next slide now. I'm smiling because Jenna always tells me that um, better time allocation. Um. <laughs> all right, so how do these skill how do these skills from APTA apply to public forum? So the first one, um, analytical responses. This is going to majorly, majorly help you with rebuttal and front lines in rebuttal um, and summary. So a lot of people like pre-write their front lines or at least think about what they're going to say beforehand. But when you come across um, responses that you haven't thought of, a lot of people freeze up. I know I did when I was in public forum. Um, if there's like a brand new creative response that I haven't you know, heard of or thought of, um, I don't know entirely what to say to it. So 
this really helps you find out what to do there because you can have this sort of um, background where you just make analytical responses on the fly to a variety of different topics. And because you know your argument so well, it'll be really, really easy to apply this sort of analytical skill that you have um, to frontlining and specifically to rebuttals as well. Um, a lot of PF is, uh, can be just like logical responses, like that argument doesn't make sense, here's why. Um, and you don't need cards for all of these types of responses for judges to buy them. So if you have a background in analytical responses and um, you can see these sort of logical link chains and why parts of that chain may be weak, um, you can call that out in rebuttal, even if you don't have a pre-written response for it or a pre-written analytic, you can just say it during a round and it will be um, taken as a good response if you make a good point. Um, and then an argument generation, very similarly, there is a lot of different types of um, areas that you can make responses in PF. For example, um, in like IR um, cases, there are plenty of IR responses um, for rebuttals, like for you know Saudi Arabia or whatever, there are plenty of responses about oil or war or, or Saudi Arabia doing something bad or the US doing something bad, whatever. But there are also responses you can make about things like human rights or the things you make about social justice. So if you know a lot about these types of arguments, there are plenty of res like um, responses you can make in rebuttal that your opponents won't really see coming because they're from a different sort of topic area. But they are still very important responses because you have a now a wide variety of um, topics that you know about and can now apply those arguments to um, these sorts of topic areas as well. Um, topic breadth, very similarly. Um, what I want to note additionally for this is about case writing. So having a wide topic breadth allows you to write about topics that you that normally would not have, um, or at least think about writing those topics you normally wouldn't have um, when you're writing your cases. So again, if there's some really cool um, logical arguments about like something social justice on an IR um, case, you don't need to write entire, entirely about IR on an IR case if there's a good um, point on, in another topic area that relates to it. Um, and you can use logical links to, to make that. Um, and if you can find a, a card or two um, or a couple, that makes it even better. Um, but again, if you have a wide topic breadth, you will expand the possibilities of what you can write cases on um, and the creativity of those points as well. Um, finally, on strategy, argument interaction is important for all speeches in public forum, literally all of them. Um, you will need to know in case how your argument will interact with the other sort of core stock arguments on the other side and like what happens if you know one of your points gets beaten um, does it mean that one of their points is not unique as well there are a lot of interactions um, in public forum rounds you need to note while you're writing your case and rebuttal it's particularly important because if you make a response that say um, knifes yourself aka it hurts you to make that response you need to be able to recognize that as well um, or if there's a front line that there's sometimes front lines that can um, hurt your own side as well by contradicting maybe your other point or contradicting a turn or a, uh, a piece of defense you put on their case, um, you need to be able to recognize those things as well. Um, finally, on collapses, all speeches in public forum need to recognize the collapses. And when I say all speeches, I mean also the case. When you're writing your case, you should be cognizant of how you're going to collapse and what you're going to collapse on. It might not be the same at every round, but you should make it really clear and you should write your case with the idea of if I need to collapse on this argument or even this sub point, how am I going to do so? Um, and will it win me the round if I have to? Um, so you don't want to rely on just one argument collapsing every time, sort of the largest impact in the round. You want to be able to be strategic and um, flex what um, argument you are collapsing on depending on that. So um, collapses for the rest of the speeches are pretty obvious, you know, for rebuttal, um, whichever point has the least amount of anchors, the easiest to deal with, easiest to collapse on, you want to go for. Um, and then similarly for summary and final focus, you should have chosen your collapses at that point um, and sort of uh, gone in, all, gone all in on them. Um, but yeah, for, for case, I think that's something public forum debaters don't do enough. Um, and I know I certainly didn't when I was a PF debater is focusing on how I'm going to collapse um, each of my arguments in my case and are each of these winning. Um, and then for time allocation, obviously all of the speeches, um, it applies here too. Um, for cases, again, it applies here as well. Um, you really need to allocate the most time 
to where you think um, you are going to be able to collapse. Sometimes you can do something sneaky and like spend a whole lot of time on something you aren't going to collapse on. And then they, the opponents spend a lot of time on that. Um, and then you collapse on the first thing that maybe wasn't as um, developed. Um, sometimes that can be a good strategy, but you need to know um, how to do good time allocation to make that strategy work in the first place and how to do good collapsing to make that strategy work. Um, so yeah, that is that. You can keep going. Um, yeah, go for it, Emmanuel. Yeah, so getting into practicals, how can you learn these skills? Um, you can do this both as a high school debater and as a college debater. Um, the biggest one is LOC drills. This will literally teach you all of the things that we're in all of those applicability sections in different ways. Um, but it's called an LSE drill. There's a link right there that you can see under set point A, and it's essentially a fully done round recorded with case statement and all of that. And so the way you do an LSE drill is you go to the link, um, you find a video, um, maybe you like go through a few and look for one that seems interesting or looks like it has really good faders in it. Um, you will like play the video until it reads case statement in the background, and then you can pause the video. Um, and start listing out your own arguments, how you might opt the case. Um, if it's something that's like very confusing, maybe you wanna listen to the POCs that were actually asked in the round to get an idea of that information. Um, but anyway, you like pause it for like 15 minutes, make your arguments, um, then you play PMC and you flow PMC while it's going and you flow your responses to PMC. And then at the end of PMC, you pause it and you get up and you deliver your LOC where you give your constructive material and then where you respond to PMC. Um, and then you do that, like ideally you would have recorded yourself doing that. Um, and then you will play the video again and see now what did the actual LOC say? And then you'll compare that to what you said, right? Like you wanna flow the LOC, you wanna flow your own speech and then compare the two. And there's so much learning if you're really earnest about it. Like the way I approach these drills is like, I assume that there's something that this debater knows that I don't know. Like that's why they're like on a national database of great rounds. And I see like, why did they do what they do? There's something in here that I don't know yet. What can I learn from that? Um, and it just teaches you a whole lot. Um, and then if you want to like the bonus, you can go to the end of the round and watch LOR PMR, see like how did they use the material that was in their LO? How did the PM use the material that was in their PMR? And that gives you an idea of which arguments will ultimately lead to collapses and how you can collapse and how you can weigh that. Um, and it's a bunch of, bunch of learning. I, I would recommend it even for PFRs um, now. Yeah, so um, another drill you can do um, is argument generation and topic breadth drills. So this is something I have suggested to people on the Discord before. Essentially, you go to um, hellomotions.com. It's essentially um, a website that just like is a database full of the different motions, aka topics that people have um, like given at sort of nationally recognized or internationally recognized tournaments um, as topics. And then you pick a motion that you like or that one that will challenge you, one you're interested in, whatever it may be. Um, and then take 15 minutes and just prepare a case for either side of that topic. Um, essentially, um, the case should last seven minutes and you just need to write an outline. You don't need to write word for word like you would a PF case. But in that outline, you should do things like what are your broad arguments? What are some maybe sub points for those arguments if you have them? What are the specific warrants for um, your arguments? And what are the specific impacts um, for your arguments? Those things are good to include in, um, in your outline. Um, and it can be hard to do this in 15 minutes, especially if you have no experience on that topic. Um, but the more you do it, the more you'll be able to generate new arguments and generate content um, for a case that should last around seven minutes. Um, and after you do this, after you take the 15 minutes, at the end of that 15 minutes, you should deliver the speech um, and record yourself and redo the speech um, if you want to afterward um, and see what you could have improved on. And figure out, this is the most important part because if you just do it over and over, um, you won't learn much from it if you don't do much reflection, um, is figure out what you did badly and what you messed up on um, and repeat that and specifically focus on that um, sort of issue area when you do your next speech. And this will, not only help you see what your problems are when delivering speeches, whether it be warrants impacting whatever, but also just like you will inherently get a wider range of topic knowledge on a really big uh, uh, range of topics because you're just picking random uh, topic areas to do this from. 
So this is a very, very good drill for PFers. Um, I have convinced some good PFers to do this, um, and they have said they find it very helpful, um, especially for things like summary, where um, you can do a lot of analytic frontlining. Um, very, very helpful drill to do. Yeah, two quick small things I'll add. Sorry, Jenna. Um, first one is that you should be recording your speeches so that you can go back later um, and learn from them just in general and these drills. And the second thing is, um, what was the second thing? Oh yeah, yeah. In general, when you're doing drills and learning, like don't just fixate on what you did badly and how you can improve it, but also try to understand earnestly what are you already doing well? What are your strengths? Because it's what you do well that will lead to a ballot. It's not fixing what goes wrong. So like, just make sure you do both. Um, yeah, so this is sort of like practical implementation. Um, Jonah, I'm not sure if you want to um, do breakout rooms or not, you can let me know, but we're gonna do something called Think, Pair, Share, and it's building off the second drill that Jonah just did. Um, we're gonna give like a motion, then give you like three minutes to think on your own. Like, what are arguments I would give for this side? Um, then after that, we're going to open breakout rooms if Jonah decides that. If not, we'll do it as a big group. And for five minutes, we'll just talk about, like, if we were building a case, how would we build this case? What arguments would we give? And we're going to try to do analytical responses. So, like, we're not using evidence, but logical warnings about what is true about the world. Um, and then we'll get back together and, like, construct the case together. Um, Jonah, do yeah. you think it makes sense for breakout rooms or... Yeah, yeah, we can do breakout rooms and just split them in half. Um, so three in one, two in the other. Um, See. And we will assign, so the first breakout room will be um, will be um, govving the motion, so sort of affirming the motion. And the second breakout room, so just pay attention when you get in your rooms, um, what you are. And the second one will be, um, will be opping, so neg to whatever the motion is um, we're about to show you. Um, so just pay attention which breakout room you're in, one or two. One is gov, two is op. Um, there'll be three of you in one, two in the other. But we're first going to have you think individually for three minutes, um, and then we'll put you into the rooms where you can then talk to your um, peer or peers um, about the topic. And then after about five to ten minutes, we will uh, pull you back in here, and then we'll talk about um, what cases we would put together um, and how we would run it. Sound See, good to everyone? Can I just get... Um, like a double check that everyone's here because there's going to be one breakout room with only two people. Um, can you just like quickly either do a thumbs up emoji or like unmute your video real fast? Um, Man, you should un un unpin your video as well. Oh, yeah, I should do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's not pinned. Okay, Evan, and then did Eric inspect? Do something I didn't notice. Okay, great, lovely. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna put you into rooms now. Oh, we should we should um show them what the motion is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All, right, All right, motion. My bad. Go ahead, Jenna. All right, the motion is this house would abandon the use of economic sanctions as a tool for achieving political aims. So. That is the motion. The first breakout room will be gov, so affirming. The second breakout room will be op, so um, the negation. Um, we'll give you three minutes to think about both sides right now, and then we will put you in the breakout rooms where you will be assigned your side um, and develop points for your side. And then we'll come back, we'll share them. Sound good? Everyone have the motion down? Also put it in the chat. So first breakout room is ASLR, Eric, and Spec. And room two is going to be Evan and Sean. Um, and I'll just put a timer now so you can think individually. So, Emmanuel, do you, uh, someone just joined? Do you want to pair them in as well to the second room? Yeah, let me do that. Um, I'll brief you really quick on what we're doing. Um, oh, looks like they just left, actually. Never mind.
about 30 seconds remaining if you want to wrap up in these last few moments. All right, cool. I'm going to open all rooms right now. And it's going to be like five, six minutes in your rooms, like discussing and pulling the arguments together for your side. And then we'll get together again and discuss. If you don't tell me why they will be targeted towards uh, poor people in these countries first, I, as the op team, can just be like, no, actually, they're going to be targeted towards the rich people and they'll be effective. They didn't tell us why they wouldn't be. So I'm going to say they will be effective, targeted rich people. This is a good thing. Um, so we need that extra work done. Um, and this is, this, is, this is a very good point. Um, it just needs that extra um, layer because you don't have the cards to sort of rely on that tell you where people are hurt by it, um, need that extra warrant level um, as yeah. well. I think the link uh, is the economy now that I think about it. It's like oil sanctions on Venezuela, they devastated their economic growth and that uh, empirically hurts poor people. Anyway, should I explain my second argument now? So well, wait, let's talk about what you just said. Um, oil sanctions on Venezuela devastated economic growth. Do you think you could just assert that without- um, Well, without I mean, obviously explain more, right? You explain right, how- but Without a card, how, how would you- how would you talk about that? Sure. So I'd give empirics. I'd say, like, for example, with Venezuela, uh, their oil sanctions devastated both their economic growth and their government's, like, ability to have stuff like pensions, stuff like uh, food programs, uh, food assistance programs. So, like, with that being said, it means the poor people are uniquely hurt more. So is that actually, like an empiric you can back up without a card is what I'm saying. Is that something that an, the, the sort of standard is like the average reader, like the average reader of the New York Times or whatever, um, would they know that all of these things are true? If not, then you need to warrant it more. Um, so maybe that we have sanctions on Venezuela could be where you could go with it. But the extra level of this hurts pensions, this does all of these things, those things you can't just assert. Um, you need to instead um, explain a little deeper on why that's true. Um, but what you could expand it is why that's true for all countries with sanctions and why that's going to be true for all countries with sanctions. So, for example, if you just say that sanctions hurt um, economic growth and warrant why that's true, instead of just talking about Venezuela, you can be like, well, if sanctions hurt, if you warrant why sanctions hurt economic growth, and then you say why sanctions are applied to a lot of different places, you can talk about why it'll hurt economic growth like everywhere instead of just um, in one place. So yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's, these are definitely like correct points and good points. Um, the point that we're trying to make with this drill um, is to really think deeply into what role um, cards play in your, in like doing the work and the warranting and making you do that work um, instead and without, without like empirics being involved in it. Um, necessarily. Okay. Yeah. Good though. Um, let's go to your second point. Oh, Jen as well. Um, someone has their hand raised. Did you want to take that now or after? Would it be okay if I tried to give an ultimate explanation? To the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. So I guess you would say that sanctions primarily hurt the coffers of the government. Is that so far so good or? Um, why do they? Sanctions hurt because governments rely on taxpayer revenue to do business or to, not to do business to like fund things. And if there's less, you know, if there's economic sanctions in a country, it means that there's less trade, which means that the government gets less money. So and that's then good. I would, yeah. Uh, and I, I think, think oh, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. Um, I think the, the one, I think you're definitely um, there. I think the one thing you're missing is what is just clarifying what sanctions will do. Um, because 
there's this sort of idea that sanctions like um, overall will always cause less trade, will always do X thing. Um, but I think it needs to be clarified that sanctions can be different um, and they can have different effects depending on the country. So you need to sort of talk about and warrant which one is the most likely, which one is the most, effect or, uh, most effective, most likely to be used, and then what the sort of uh, impacts of that would be. So what you're talking about is the sanctions that would be um, either targeted at the poorest people increasing the prices, then you know, um, making it so there's less tax revenue, or sanctions on like really rich people reducing their income, um, less tax, less taxes on them kind of thing. Um, so I think you are there with all of your points, um, just need more on why the sanctions you're talking about will cause that um, sort of tax decrease or whatever it may be. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, cool. Um, yeah, keep going though. Um, you were getting oh, there. Yeah. And then so the second point is the government is it's in charge of spending and the government has to allocate spending between different sectors. One would be welfare, the other would be the military. And then I would say that because of worse economic conditions, um, and you already pointed out like the areas needed that I still need to prove about worse economic conditions. That means that countries inherently become more unstable, which means that governments always have an incentive to prioritize military spending over welfare spending. And then that hurts low income individuals. So why why does military it, it's 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 inherent, but why does military spending hurt low income individuals? Because if there's more um, because like the government only has a limited amount of money, and so that money has to go somewhere. If that money is going to the military, it by definition means it's not going to welfare programs. Good, good, very good. Um, and yeah, and then you can impact that to social services being cut, um, these being some of the most important things they rely on, um, you know, poor people's lives being Sort of ruined from that. That's really, really good. Um, all right. And yeah, so thank you for clarifying that. That was great. Um, what about the second point on credibility? I think uh, ALSR, whoever that was, left. Yeah, so, Laura said to go. Okay. I guess. Um, I guess I, I, I guess I'll take over this. So I didn't really understand the first part on the UN and NATO. Eric, do you wanna try to explain that or? Um, no, I'm not entirely sure what he's trying to say there or, but. Okay, I, I guess I can do. Wait, wait, um, I'm like, I, I didn't write the credibility arc like at all, but overall I think the idea was kind of that it leads to like, like I guess like the um, the globe becomes like divided by sanctions and I can explain that part because it was just like the first part that was the part that he wrote and then I did C and D, um, so yeah I okay so I guess drop the first two sub points quotation marks, uh, so for the second point the idea was that basically what sanctions do is sanctions going off the previous idea that sanctions cause economic devastation sanctions are inherently unpopular by the countries that are being sanctioned. Because that is true, those countries have less of an incentive to work with the United States. And the reason for that is because they view the United States as opposed to their interests. Therefore, they're not going to be working with someone who is directly opposed to their interests, unless obviously there's like some exigent circumstances. And because of that, there is another outcome, which is that countries still need trade. And so they will likely turn to actors who are viewed as less opposed to their interest. And when that occurs there, um, so the example that we gave was, let's say North Korea trading with China. And then Iran also trades with China and Iran trades with Venezuela. And these are all countries the US has sanctions on minus China. Um, and because of that, they're more incentivized to trade with each other. And that splits the globe amongst economic blocks. That's really bad because that hurts globalization. Globalization is good because, you know, opportunity costs when the world works together, there's better economic outcome, et cetera. Okay, I like it. So I can kind of explain the third point. I didn't really 
to like explain it super well when Edison and Laura was like writing all our arguments together. But basically the idea is uh, we end up hurting somebody economically. We can, if like, okay, so we're like by enforcing sanctions, if we're enforcing sanctions on a smaller country, then like we can just tie back into our Venezuela example. Yes, I know it needs like more warranting or whatever. Um, yeah, we need a warrant into like econ economic devastation and such. But like, if we do do that work, then we then like in the case of a smaller country with less economic power and less like existing, um, I guess influence, then we like economically devastate that country. We hurt the poor, whatever. Um, if it's a larger country, we can like just like tie into China, like in the status quo, China's growth outpaces the U.S. Whatever, even like despite U.S. sanctions. So. I, I guess like with in like larger like medium to larger sized countries, they will like join. I guess it, it kind of ties, ties into our second point, like that um, the they'll form like economic blocks and such. And so instead of trading with us, they trade with whatever the friends or whatever, and we don't we lose out on that trade. Um, we hamper our own economic growth, and they benefit from it in a way. Kind of, I don't know. It's yeah. That, no, that's good. Um, just what. My only question would be, what would be the impact of people splitting up into economic blocks? Mm, yeah. Yeah, so it was a little explained before. Um, there's a couple different impacts you could, you could go off of from it. Um, the globalization impact, they said, is one. Um, you can also talk about why, you know, China getting more economically powerful is not necessarily good, right? Um, the US you can say, you know, the US might be bad, but China as a you know, global economic superpower would be even worse and them getting more powerful is, is also bad. I mean, there are plenty of reasons you can, you can say for that. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's a couple different things you can do with that, but that link chain was very good. Um, um, and you can, you can maybe even make that a sub point under um, the second point and say why um, both things are links into that impact that you uh, explained. So yeah, that's good. Um, do we have anything, any other points from the government team? Mm, I think that was pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Could I jump in and like, as you're going like gov, you should be thinking through like, how could we have preempted this if we had included this content in our original speech? Um, but whoever wants to speak from op can go ahead. Uh, sure. So our first uh, argument is that it basically stops leaders from doing worse things. That's to say, basically, if a, like, let's say a leader of a country is, like, doing something bad for their country, like, let's say Venezuela or North Korea is, sanctions will basically stop the leader from, uh, like, making their country even worse, like, and then then basically, even if the sanctions end up harming the people like a little bit, it's still better than uh, without sanctions because without sanctions, that leader is going to go farther and basically destroying their country and just bettering their own interests. So basically, it's just stopping. It's basically stopping authoritarian regimes from doing things like human rights abuse, uh, basically destroying their economies and so forth, in favor of. It's basically stopping those things by saying, like telling the leader, if you do more of this, your personal finances will be harmed in a sense. No leader wants to do that. Sanctions will be an effective way to better uh, the standards in those countries. All right, awesome. Um, my main question would be, um, why will sanctions be effective at having them do those things? Uh, yeah, I kind of glossed over that. So basically, uh, it's because I'd say for most people, uh, such as like Kim, say Maduro or Kim Jong Un, their number one incentive is usually like financial. So if you can sanction them such that the sanctions are harming their personal finances, the idea is like sanctions will be fairly effective in like swaying them one way or the other because it's uh, like incentivizing them through their number one incentive, which is like their personal finances. Yeah, that's good. Um, and this is like pretty nitty gritty, but the only other thing I would want is like why sanctions are likely to hurt their personal finances. If that makes sense. So like um, it like definitionally does, but I, I think the both teams need to prove why 
sanctions either are effective or aren't effective in doing their, you know, their goal um, because there aren't any cards. So if the op team can prove, um, or if, if either team can prove that it is or is not effective, um, there's a lot of different arguments that you can make off of that um, based on specifically this. If it's not effective, then they won't care about their personal finances because they aren't actually hurt, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's good. Um, do we have another argument from op? Yeah, I can, I can take this one. Uh, so the next argument kind of concerns what the alternative to sanctions would be. Um, so starting off, in the absence of sanctions, it's not like governments such as the United States are not going to do anything on the international stage to pressure their opponents. Uh, for example, with Venezuela or North Korea, if the United States were to simply stop putting pressure on Maduro, who they have said in the past has committed humanitarian atrocities, same thing with Kim Jong-un, they would be seen as weak, they would be seen as going back on their promises, they would be seen as condoning humanitarian abuses. So they would have to do something. In the absence of sanctions, uh, an alternative, probably the primary primary alternative would be military action. Uh, the warrant there is basically just, I can't really think of another way to put pressure on a dictatorial regime outside of either economic pressure or military pressure. Um, that is comparatively worse than sanctions, even if there are bad effects from sanctions. It is comparatively worse, A, because military conflicts directly kill civilians, directly kill soldiers, directly kill a lot of people. B, uh, there's literal physical kinetic destruction of economic infrastructure and regular infrastructure, roads, bridges, banks, etc that makes development in the long term a lot harder, even if there are short term economic damages from sanctions. Uh, I think that's pretty much the argument, yeah. That makes sense. I think one additional piece of weighing you could give is that um, your argument is not that it's always going to be military intervention in every single case where they're not sanctions, but it's likely that in some scenarios, this is literally the only tool you have, and then you already have your weighing about why this is awful. And that just lowers yeah. the burden for off and what you have to do. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, All right. We had another argument, unless there's something yeah, yeah. you want to say about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, for it. go for it. All right. So the next argument we were thinking about um, is a bit more squirrely. Uh, it concerns international treaties. Basically, for a lot of like kind of forms of international law, international treaties, the one that came to mind was the NPT. The punishment for violating that treaty is always going to be sanctions because there's no kind of like, besides the UN peacekeepers, there's no like international military body. So without the threat of economic sanctions, there is almost no way to consistently enforce international treaties. Um, bad for a few reasons. I mean, the NPT is probably good because it enforces denuclearization. It prevents people from proliferating. Proliferation is bad because uh, it, it uh, when somebody develops a nuclear weapon, it creates nuclear imbalances, encouraging more people to develop nuclear weapons than creating, you know, more dangers of nuclear conflict, emboldening conventional conflict. Uh, there's probably other impacts to harming international treaties uh, that I just can't think of because I don't know a lot about international law. Sean, one thing I really like about what you, I like what everyone said, like just to be really clear a bit, and I didn't interject earlier because Jonah was leading it, but one thing I like is that the word efficiency with which you explained the second argument, um, I thought that was really good. Um, yeah, sorry, anyway, that's all I'll say. Um, Jonah, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I think I think you can make the third, I, I really like the third point, but I think you can make it less specific to NPT, just say broadly international agreements in general. Like, I don't see any reason, and NPT can just be an example instead. Um, I don't see any reason why any other international agreement would be any different, um, right? Because there's no mechanism to enforce um, any of this without sanctions or literal invasions. So um, you yeah. could just say, and you can just think of different broad categories of where international law exists, like climate change, um, human rights, uh, obviously nuclearization, as you said. Um, any of these things where international law tries to be influential, if you can't enforce it with anything, aka if, if gov is correct and you remove sanctions, then there's literally nothing you can do and um, no international law has any teeth ever. So um, yeah, that's, that's super good. And you can even link that into your um, sort of uh, second argument and say, if we don't have this to enforce it, but someone's causing really, really bad human rights abuses, 
then the international community is going to step in militarily more. Um, and that's really bad, right? Because that's the only other thing, that's the only other way they can do so. Um, so yeah, I think that's really good. And it can link really well into your, your second point as well. Um, I'll ask this to the op first. What, after hearing the sort of Gov's points, what do you think you could have added into your op case to pre that could have preempted um, some of their arguments? Let's go back and review what the, what the Gov was for them. Um, so like, uh, off, off's first contention is very, like, it's, uh, it uses a very similar example, like in Venezuela that we do for our, I guess our first contention, right? Mm -hmm. And so like thinking about that, like, yeah, it would probably be fairly easy to see before around that maybe we, they would also use Venezuela since Venezuela is such a. I guess a notable example of sanctions being used by like the specifically the US federal government. And so we say that I guess Venezuela gets like ec economically harmed or and so like they say um the I guess the government will harm them if there are no sanctions. And in this case we stop the government from harming them. But here instead of uh, I guess like here instead of sanctions being the direct cause of the harm. Like, I mean, like in, in both worlds, we end up having like harm to the people of Venezuela specifically at the very least. I think maybe we can make the argument that if we invade Venezuela, we can overthrow the dictators as though I'm pretty sure the US hasn't shown like any inclination for wanting to do that at any point in time. Like, mm -hmm. so I, I yeah, want you to explain this clearly. No, that, that's that's fine. I want you to compare your first point um, and their first point and see if there's any problems or ways that you can sort of, and you're honestly your second point as well, um, see if there's any way that you can sort of co-opt or prevent their impact from happening just by sort of applying your first point there. Also, no pressure on you, Eric. Like, if anyone wants to jump in from Gov, feel free. Yeah, whoever spec is, um, go for it. Yeah, so what I was, like, just listening to both cases, I realized that in the round, both sides make the assumption that the United States uses economic sanctions against bad, quote, bad countries for, quote, good reasons, which is something that we could have preempted by just saying, like, the United States uses economic sanctions against certain countries that maybe do not like actually have human rights violations or anything like that. And if we stop those sanctions, that's good because, you know, the country's not doing anything. It's just the U.S. exerting influence. And I think that if we just focus in on those countries, it takes them out of a lot of like their examples, because if the U.S. is just using economic sanctions to gain political leverage, it doesn't make sense that it would militarily invade. And if it's not preventing bad actors from messing things up further, then there's no impact on that level. So I would say that we could have started off by saying like the United States primarily uses economic sanctions against countries that do no wrong, but you know. Right, right, and you can, you, right, exactly. And you can even say the most popular cases are those against really oppressive dictators, but that's not the majority of cases you can say, right? Um, yeah, yeah. The reality is up, in, in, in rounds like this, reality is up to what you can warrant and what you can sort of logically prove. Um, so it might not be like in reality true because there's no way of knowing without cards if it is or isn't. So if you can logically prove why the majority of cases would just be viewed for political leverage instead of for actual human rights reasons, that's 100% something you can do. That's very good, yeah. Um, did, has the govs, have you have y'all seen the sort of clash between your two, your first and second? I guess your whole case and then their their first point. Um, do you see why that sort of beats their first point? Or does does op see why that beats their first point? And how would the op respond to that if, if they did um, get preempted in that way? Sorry, what was the specific preempt? I don't really understand it. Yeah, so I'm trying to I'm trying to coax the preempt out of you, but um, 
what it is basically. And if Emmanuel, you could go back to the, to, yeah. Um, so it will not prevent them from messing things up if the countries are already sort of going off and bonding with China and Russia and whatever other countries. So there's no economic incentive for them to stop doing what is bad if they are tied to those countries um, and have sort of trade deals with those countries. Um, and so what the gov could have done is been like, look, um, them being scared of these sanctions and then being tied to China and Russia who won't sanction them and like being economically reliant on them means that the West will never have any sort of leverage, economic leverage to stop them from doing bad things by sanctioning them because they aren't even economically tied to them very much. Um, so you can use your second point to sort of preempt the first op point from ever happening because there's no economic leverage for the um, first op point to happen. And that's sort of the link that they use into why they prevent bad actions. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I think, yeah, sorry. Um, I didn't really understand the question when you were asking it. That was one of the things that we were thinking of is um, to say that like, if it's not actually effective, then what happens is it prevents it prevents risk of solvency from ever occurring. I don't know what the exact phrase is that uh, is used for that, but it's like it prevents any possibility of solving an issue. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think I think you can just phrase it like that. You can just say we 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 preempt them, we take out their link. You know, um, yeah. There there's connections like that um, when you're looking at your case that you can sort of just like beat a lot of the op by doing very little work or beat a lot of the neg even, you know, if you're asked from doing, um, by doing very little work just by applying your points in the correct way. Um, so we're gonna move now to um, how we saw the round and what the sort of process we went through to develop the case. So when you're doing these drills, you know how to actually effectively spend your time to like, um, to do these things. So we spent 15 minutes, me and Emmanuel on each side, um, and we'll, we'll like very briefly talk about how we saw the round um, and go through the cases. Um, so on Gov, we wanted two overviews to sort of clarify um, who is getting sanctioned and um, why sanctions are used, because we think that's really important um, to clarify what actors we're talking about and the sort of the incentives for the people sanctioning, uh, why they are sanctioning. So we talk about, you know, it's oppressive dictatorships, um, people with religious rule, um, that's pretty obvious, but we wanted to sort of circumvent the whole, um, oh, it's people that don't deserve sanctions that are getting sanctions argument um, right there. And then we went in and talked about um, there are political and international relations reasons people use sanctions. We think that's pretty clear. Um, and then we got into the sort of uh, meat of, of the argument, which is it hurts the poorest people. We think um, obviously Gov said this argument, um, but what I want to point out is we added in why specifically asset freezes, which is a lot of what um, people use in sanctions, like freezing the assets of like the richest people, why that's not really effective. Um, and we gave a couple warrants for why that's true. Um, uh, Emmanuel, could you link like the shareable, like the readable link to this document just so they could like look at it? Um, cool. And then um, we also, I think is, one of the most important things we did in this gov case was present burdens for the op side. So what did the op side have to do to win? Um, what do they have to prove to win? So if you can see there where it says problem, these people are already in oppressive societies, this presents three burdens to the op. If you could zoom in a little bit, Emmanuel, that'd be uh, great. But um, it says, um, one, you need to prove that they, oh, okay, well, yeah, okay. One, you need to prove um, why they wouldn't have revolted already. So. We, we sort of start with the premise that sanctions are meant to put pressure on the government um, to do what the international community wants them to do. So we start with that premise. We then say, okay, if they wanna put pressure on the people to put pressure on the government, why wouldn't the people have already done so? Make op prove that first. Second thing you need to prove is why, if they ever wanted to do this, how they would have the capacity to do so. Um, do they have the actual capacity to put pressure on the government? Do they have arms, whatever it may be, to actually make the government stop doing what they're doing? And then the third burden is that even if it was fully, um, uh, if it was fully, uh, what's the word for it, uh, successful or whatever, putting pressure on the government, 
would that new government, if it were to be a thing, be a good or better version of the government that you had before? Um, so these are three sort of burden structures that we set up where the op has to go through and prove why sanctions would be effective. Um, really specifically. Um, yeah, we can skip to the rest of it because it's it's a lot of just like stuff that you all already said, like it destabilizes the country, it makes connections with places like China, Russia, whatever, um, and that's bad. Um, and it can create like um, black market loopholes or whatever, where they funnel their money into places where it can't get sanctioned. So that was sort of our gov case. Um, and then Emmanuel can talk about the op, the, the, the op side of the case. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really, I don't care as much about the specific arguments. I think um, we also had nuclear weapons. Um, something that does matter is like our general process for how we did this. Um, we spent the first three minutes thinking separately, like, like brainstorming arguments. And then we came together and we talked. And a lot of our time was spent like predicting, okay, what is the other team going to say? And then we literally asked ourselves, what argument can we give that co-ops that? What argument can we give that turns that? What argument can we give that outweighs that? And we just like answered those questions and then wrote those arguments down, um, which gave us a more efficient case. In terms of the specific arguments, um, I don't know. Like, I don't know. We proved that asset freezes work. Um, why war is likely to be the counterfactual. We frontlined why sanctions aren't a link into war. So a gov argument could have been, well, if you use sanctions, that's going to lead to war. And so we preempted why that's not going to happen. Talked about nuclear weapons. I don't know. Jonah, did you want me to go specifically into the arguments? I don't, I don't really no, know. That, that's okay. They, they, can, they can read it. But basically, um, when the main thing I want to get across here is that when there are things that need to be clarified that can't be clarified through cards, um, you can see we set burdens and overviews in both of our cases on both sides. And that is something that's super, super helpful um, because burdens are much harder to fulfill when they have to logically warrant their way out of them. Um, so definitely suggest setting up some burdens and even in, in PF rounds as well, setting up burdens is super effective um, because it basically creates tiers that your opponents have to get through to win the round. So if you say they have to do this and then even if they do that, they have to do this. And then even if they do that, they have to do this to win the round. Um, that makes it super effective. Uh, it's a super effective way to, to get your opponents in a hard, hard spot. Um, so we highly suggest doing that. Um, but yeah, doing, doing this drill, um, I know this is a, this is a related to topics you have done before in the past about sanctions and international community and whatever. Um, but even this, um, you can learn a lot about, about how the arguments interact. And if you do other topic areas that will be, um, way, way, way more helpful to you um, because you will just like think of arguments you haven't been forced to think of before. Um, yeah, so with that, um, you're done with that drill. Um, also done with the presentation, unless you all have questions for us about APTA, about how to apply it to PF, whatever it may be, um, we are willing to answer those questions. Uh, one question that- Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Sean, are you talking? No, go ahead. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, one question I had about so, as an uh, APDA competitor, how much like what do you spend your time doing for the event when you're not competing? Like, do you is it mainly practice or is it mainly prep for your case? Given that you can't really find cards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, it's 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 both. Honestly, uh, we do a lot of practice rounds, but we also do um, casework. Because cases um, can't be like reused at tournaments, like you can't use the same case um, every time you gov. You have to have different cases to be able to run, um, and it's strategic to you know have different topic areas of cases written for different people, um, and just like a wide variety of cases in general for your own um, knowledge purposes. So yeah, we write a lot of cases, um, and we do a lot of like practice rounds and things like that. Good question. Yeah, um, this isn't specifically about uh, Emmanuel. Could you just uh, put the link to the cases that we wrote for the drill in the chat so I can put them in the description of the video? Yeah, absolutely. Let me All do right. And I guess I do have a question about APTA. Um, 
So the drill that we did today was kind of focused on like coming up with case arguments quickly, analytically generating those kinds of arguments. Um, do you think there are any other drills that would be useful for coming up with um, coming up with analytic responses to case arguments? Yeah, so uh, the LOC drill is what you want for that. Um, that drill will force you to come up with our, like uh, an off case, so uh, the neg side arguments, but also respond to the PMC stuff. Um, yeah, basically you just, we linked, uh, we linked earlier and we can link it again. It's just like a list of after rounds, like a spreadsheet of just many rounds. And then you just listen to the case statement, the background, and then the PMC, and then you develop your off case or your neg case, and then give the line by line to the PMC as well. And that'd be a really good version to do uh, for that because there's a really, really wide variety of topics on that spreadsheet, so. Two other things that are really helpful. The first is re-giving speeches that other people have given that were fantastic. Like you flow, you watch them, flow them, and then re-give their speech and you can record it. I have literally like re-given their speech seven or eight times until I really actually understand the arguments they gave. And at that point where I can re-explain it, then I also understand why what they gave were like good responses. And then I use those arguments everywhere else. Um, and I look smart because it looks like I made it up, but I didn't. Um, second way you can do that is um, just applying things you learn from classes. Um, a lot of times there are like central clashes that exist in the world. And like you all are smart people, like as you're going through classes, you'll find out, oh, what I just learned probably applies to X clash. And then I'll literally just like analytically think through how did the knowledge I just get how can I transition that into warrants? And then I'll block out both sides of that issue, why it's true, why it's false, um, why it's more important, why it's less important. Um, it's great for refutation. Any other questions from people? Um, and if you think of something later, you can always feel free to Discord DM me. Uh, Spec, did you have something? If you ever give this drill to people who are uh, more unfamiliar with APTA, would you, or people who are familiar with PF but not APTA, would you recommend everyone learning fully the APTA format before engaging the drill or just having people like, if they were to give out all the speeches, would it be okay to just do like PF speeches but cases are impromptu? Yeah, yeah, that could that could be that could definitely be good. You don't need to know the, the APTA format. Um, we kind of just we kind of just explain that. Um, to show what the format we do is, if anyone is interested in, in college parley, um, and sort of the basis for the, the analytical structure, like being no cards. But no, you can definitely use the PF structure um, and just do analytical cases just on the topics, um, on just like the random topics on Hello Motions. Uh, you can certainly do that. And that'd probably be um, pretty applicable as well if you do the PF structure that people are familiar with. Feel free to um, like reach out if you have any other questions too. Um, you all are kings. I'm like really proud of you for I don't know, a couple days after Christmas attending a lecture. So, um, Jonah, did you have anything like any other thoughts? Uh, nope. If you have, again, if you have questions, feel free. Um, and if you ever want to like um, record yourself doing a redo or something for a speech, um, I am almost always down to to sort of like listen to your, your redo and critique your speech uh, for free or whatever. Uh, I love uh, this format. I love sort of analytical uh, speeches. So if you ever want to improve, um, feel free to send me one of your redos and I'll um, tell you what to improve, what you did well, whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for doing this, Jonah. And thanks Bye. for coming, Emmanuel. We we really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It was fun. Bye. Have a nice yes. day.